Awesome. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to TGSF1. And today we're doing episode two of Bold Predictions. And as you can see, I'm joined by a very special guest who needs no introduction, but I'll go for it anyway. It is a F1 content creator genius that is uh, Josh Revel. Josh, welcome to TGSF1. Uh, nice t-shirts. How are you? Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> and uh, how are you feeling about being on TGSF1? It's an absolute honor, mate. <laughs> no, it's... it's uh... It's cool, man. It's good to it's good to be part of, uh, part of one of your videos for your channel. Um, yeah, yeah, nah. Um, holding up well. I'm enjoying this T-shirt. We'll be ready soon. But, <laughs> yeah, it gets good to debut on your channel, mate. Awesome, appreciate it. And uh, just to add a bit of uh, context to the video, obviously I did a, a bold predictions for the 2020 season, um, and then reached out to you because you'd done one that was perhaps not necessarily labeled as bold predictions, but you've done your own predictions for, for 2020. And one of my bold predictions was one of your actual genuine predictions for this season, which was a bit of a, a shuffle of the bottom two of the pack on the Constructors' Championship between Williams and Haas. Um, so I just thought it'd be interesting just to maybe get your thoughts on, on that again and maybe explain why you think it is that that one might come to fruition because I was on the same wavelength for, for this year. And if we ever get racing, I think it would be an interesting battle at the bottom, should we say? Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, like, um, <clears throat> it's all sort of uh, pseudoscience, you know, that type of thing. Just like, oh, well, how do you know that? I don't really, I just think it's going to happen. But sort of the signs are there. And one of the things that, um, actually, it's because during preseason testing, Williams definitely were not the fastest team, but they were better than last time, mainly because the car was actually out on the track. Yeah, it got there. Um, <laughs> but of course, Haas didn't really change their position too much on the timing sheets and on the road. They were just the same as well. They're on the side of the friggin' track or in the wall. That's what you get for hiring Grosjean. Um, but of course, you know, over the course of the season, um, I think with them, they're going to be fighting over minor points. So it's not as if it's between Ferrari and Red Bull or Mercedes where they're going to need a consistent run of points. I really think that um, Russell may not need Latifi too much to factor into this. I think Haas are going to trip over themselves too much. And um, another problem with this is that um, although Steiner is not a bad leader by any means, um, Things just did not seem to be handled well, especially when you watch Drive to Survive. Um, when Toto, when things went wrong at Mercedes, you get the impression they're working together as a team. But with uh, Steiner, it's constantly, constantly uh, you know, the, the swearing and whatever, and threatening like, you know, if I, I'll have to make some changes here, we have to do better. But you know, that's funny and all, kind of, but. You also get the impression that it's just, it's not the right type of thing to do. You know, it's making things toxic. And there hasn't been much improvement lately. Whereas with Williams, you get the impression that they're potentially on the up and up. And that's why I thought, well, maybe there'll be a change in pace here. And, and even more besides, a Haas didn't look particularly good next to Williams. But yeah, really, that's, that's what it all boiled down to and why I made that prediction. Yeah, definitely. I think I was on the same sort of wavelength with the with the Steiner situation. I recently did a video on on Zach Brown and how different I see the way he handles things as a as a sort of a team leader at, at McLaren, who obviously I, I'm a big fan of. And I think those things do filter through to the team. So it'll be interesting to see if that one comes through. But today, obviously, uh, we're sort of going to take a little bit of a look a year out in advance, even sort of broader and less scientific predictions. And I know you said at the start of your 2020 predictions you, you know people are going to comment saying how did you know that what are you on about you're probably going to be wrong about a lot of them but that's why I like to put yeah. the word bold at the front of mine because then I got a bit of a bit of wiggle room and a bit of a way out for when none of it eventually happens so um, I know you mentioned you would got one of them lined up so you know forget in 2020 might not even go racing looking ahead to 2021 which should have been the the year of the new regs but obviously isn't going to be what are some of the things that you think could happen and how realistic are they and how just completely wild are they? Well, um, this one would probably, because it depends, because of this damn virus going around, um, it's 
obviously changed a lot of things that's been happening. Well, changed a lot of things. The season hadn't started yet. <laughs> that's a big change. Um, so, and we don't know when the season's going to get over, or when it's going to start, rather. Um, but let's just assume that we get racing in July. It's optimistic, but let's just presume it does. Um, we get to run 12, 13 races, whatever it is. And that's a relative full season, and that's enough for, oh, Mr. Toro Rosso there, Alpha Tauri, to look at the, and especially since Marco loves the musical chairs with his bloody drivers, um, for him to go, mm, we've had Kvyat here since 2014, was it? Yeah, was it 2014? Yeah. Um, time for a bit of a switcheroo. So who are we going to get? Now, with the Red Bull Junior program, um, they've definitely got people in there that are talented enough to progress to Formula One, but none right now that have the super license points. So who do they replace Kvyat with? Here's the bold prediction. 2021, the lineup for AlphaTauri will be Pierre Gasly and Dan Ticton. And the reason I say that Dan Ticton will get the call up again, even though he's been dumped from the Red Bull program, is because just because you're dumped from the Red Bull program does not mean you're going to be back. It does not mean you're not going to be back in it. Exhibit A, Brendan Hartley, even though he wasn't particularly good in Formula One, um, he still got in. Alexander Albon. Sergio Sedicamara has just come back in as the reserve driver after being dumped after one year in the program in 2016. It's not out of the question. And I think the people at Red Bull are aware that even though Dan Tictum has a loose connection between his brain and mouth, and I mean, hey, I've got the same problem, is that <laughs> he's talented, you know? And his racing record speaks for itself. You know, he's, he's got results. He is a dual Macau Grand Prix winner. Um... And of course, you know, they don't happen by accident. So, of course, you've got to actually look at him as though he's a viable option for Formula One in the future, so long as he can harness things um, on a PR standpoint and his temperament and everything like that. And after I made that Dan Ticton video, I got a message from him. And it seemed as though he actually realized that, yeah, he hasn't made it easy for himself. So as long as he can carry that forward, that'd be great for him. And I think as well, Red Bull say, Okay, let's give him another shot because I've done that before. Um, and as I said, at the moment, a part of the uh, Red Bull Junior program, I don't think those drivers are going to get those super license points uh, in time for next year. Mm. And do you see that as being the, the end of Kvyat in Formula One? Is that waving goodbye to, uh, to the Russian? In a race driver, yeah, at a race, if I'm, as a race driver, yeah, but he, he'll absolutely you know be a reserve driver test driver and other and other teams because there already was one at um at ferrari after he was dumped from toro rosso so you know it's not not out around the possibility paddock. but at the very least you know we know how helmet marco is with um with the red bull juniors so i'd be if we get a season going and that's the crucial thing if we get a season season going then it's going to be a case of, okay, is Kvyat warranted another year? I don't think it's something that a real that should be it should be done because, you know, Rebel should be looking toward the future. Kvyat's sort of been here, done that. And I mean, the Bueme and Ald Aldiswari or Dio Squire or whatever he wants to go by nowadays, they were there for less time than what Kvyat has been. And, mm. you know, so... It's not as if um, Kvyat's going to be getting a, a raw end of the deal, necessarily. You know, he's had a decent run in Formula 1. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm probably, um, probably ready to, to see the back of him. I don't think he's brought a huge amount of it, excitement to the races for a while, other than the odd uh, torpedo. Turn one at Shanghai. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come at me like a torpedo. Yeah, exactly. What? You guys <laughs> just ran into each other. But I... <laughs> and and then, obviously, uh, of course, that incident at Sochi, which i got to thank him for because that cesspool of an absolute waste of friggin' racetrack <laughs> is the single worst racetrack I have ever seen in my life. And it's actually made it an entertaining race, even if it was for just 30 seconds. <laughs> and but one thing you referenced there, just in a little bit of your explanation with um, Marco, obviously playing a bit of musical chairs and seeming to become 
more and more of a, a loose cannon and some crazy ideas come out of him more and more frequently, it seems. But also you referenced there the, the junior program and some of those drivers perhaps not being able to get the points and not being ready to, to step up. What do you think the situation at Red Bull is more broadly? Because to me, it's almost so focused on Max now that they've almost, they've almost not quite got that junior team and that junior set up right for, for a few years now. Do you agree with that? Or do you I think that they're... I necessarily say that. I mean, there's definitely been an emphasis on Max Verstappen, obviously because um, aside from the fact that he's got the biggest fan base in Formula 1 by far, um, argue, more arguably, um, I mean, for God's sake, he's got the entire freaking population of Belgium and, I- and Ireland. What the hell are the Irish supporting the best <laughs> Um The Netherlands and Belgium are all behind him. And it, it, it is huge, the support he gets. Um, and of course, you know, it just took two races for Kvyat to be booted out of Red Bull, but Verstappen had a horrible first, se- uh, first half of the season and they were asking us to be patient. Well, I mean, uh, while Verstappen is definitely talented, beyond you know, question, it was quite evident that, that Red Bull were viewing him as the next prodigy and we're going to run with him whether you like it or not. But that doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to lose focus on the junior team because that's a different thing. Um, I just think that they haven't necessarily um, chosen drivers that can carry out the job to an adequate level. And I think as well as that, the super license um, has come into um, come into effect, where you can't have a Verstappen coming in anymore from Formula Three after one year of karting and then bank put him in the top row, so you can't do that yeah. anymore. Um, I mean, if you look at the current lineup, are there Formula One worthy drivers in there? Yes, Igor Fraga, Liam Lawson potentially, um, Jihan Daruvula, if you are completely one-eyed and you ignore the fact that he's had enough time in junior formula to perform and he just hasn't. No, there are some in there that can definitely do it, but they can't get those points yet for the super mm. license, and as a result of that, um, they don't have a lot of options. And meanwhile, Dan Tickton is almost certainly going to get those super license points. He's definitely talented enough. Red Bull are aware of that. And that's why I'm like, okay, well, put two and two together here. If Red Bull say to Kivya, Kaki te Arnold, then there you go. There you go. It remains to be seen. Interesting. Fantastic. Now that's a really good uh, first one. And then I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll throw one back at you, which uh, is one that I've been thinking about a little bit this week as we uh, sort of led up to this call and that's with the whole, you know, Aston Martin racing point for Cindia, you know, whatever the situation is going to be and uh, whatever they are. Still spiking me. Obviously coming in with that, uh, you know, the, the newly branded team for, for 2021, but obviously all the signs were there from testing and from the media that this year that that racing point outfit is going to be, Quite a, quite a nippy one and maybe towards the top end of that midfield, if not the best of the rest this year. So with a bit of extra time and with a bit of new sort of emphasis on um, you know coming in as Aston Martin now, they're chatting a good game like they always do. Every team says they want to be winning podiums in the first two, three years, blah, blah, blah. But if they stick with the same lineup, they do have two podium uh, standard drivers with them going into 2021. So what do you think about the possibility that one, the Aston Martin will get on the podium in 2021 and then even more bold, um, both Perez and Lance Stroll finding their way onto the podium in 2021. Is that too wild? Not necessarily. I mean, I know I give Stroll a lot of crap, but when when the chips are down, man, I mean, um, his big problem has been qualifying and that's affected his race as a consequence. If he can harness that, you know, his race pace is not bad. Um, so, and I mean, like, all it takes is just for a Spain 2016 where we got the two leaders running into each other and all of a sudden all kinds of possibilities line up. Or even just a track where the car's just turned on. You know, it can happen. Um, it's Stroll... Um, Lawrence Stroll has invested heavily in the team and in Aston Martin. He's not short of cash and, you know, I'm sure he'll be willing to put in the resources and the infrastructure to make sure that this actually comes to fruition. It's not 
out of the realms of possibility for sure. Do I think um, they both could be on the podium? Yeah, potentially. I mean, we don't know, but um, definitely not out of the realm. It's not, it's, it's not as if you're asking, oh, can Roman Grosjean win the world championship? No, let's be realistic. <laughs> um, just. Leave yeah. him out alone. Come I, I on. I definitely think that's a possibility. <laughs> I definitely think it's a possibility, though. Um, and uh, whether they want to race or not, I don't know. I, again, it, it's that's the problem nowadays with modern Formula One. Whilst I don't, uh, whilst I couldn't give two tosses about the noise, and whilst it would be good to have V10s come back and make your eardrums bleed and everything like that, I'm focused on racing. But I mean, let's be honest. It's not good seeing only three teams um, have a possible chance of it, let alone constantly fighting for it. So it's good to see Racing Point slash Esther Martin slash Spiker slash <laughs> I give up um, <laughs> fighting, you know, if, uh, at least come, it's starting to come into contention now. So it's definitely a good thing. Yeah, awesome. Cool. And then last one, because uh, I know you've had a long day already, but you just referenced it there. Obviously, it's been a long time, I think, since it was Kimi and the Lotus, I think, since we've seen anyone outside of those top three take a win. And I think for 2020, everyone's expecting Lewis to come away as, uh, as, as the king once more. 2021, do you see anyone outside of Mercedes? And do you see anyone outside of Lewis Hamilton being a world champion come the end of the 2021 season? Yeah. Um, Red Bull and Verstappen. I do think that. And um, I say, I say, I mean, like, I haven't even tried to think of the other ones yet. But I think if if Aston develop a good enough car, Verstappen's not crazy anymore. He's a, you know, he's a safe driver, just about. But he's aggressive enough to a point where he's not, you know, reckless um, and fast enough. Obviously. Red Bull have now got a stable teammate in Alexander Albon where I don't necessarily think he's on Verstappen's level, but he's still fast, he's competent, he's consistent. So that's a great teammate to have. And I'll get into that, I'll get into that subject with Ferrari later on. But I think if Red Bull get all the ingredients right, and that's definitely going to um, help their chances with Ferrari, that depends on something I'm going to talk about later on um with racing point aston martin again uh, uh, um they're both they're both safe drivers present stroll they don't do stupid things i mean i don't think stroll is particularly world champion material <laughs> um he's you know he's a driver that generally gets the car from the start to the finish and in the points whatever have you and if he can harness his qualifying you know again Right, and Racing Point have got two, you know, competent drivers in that regard. So, awesome. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess really it depends on everything. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, but yeah, the teams really do need to work in tandem here. Yeah, and as we've seen with Drive to Survive, you know, on one end of the grid you have got the world champions, cool, calm, collected, and on the other end with Haas. I've had enough of you. You will let that team down by questioning all the time, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> spot on. Spot just, on impersonation. I just, love doing, <laughs> I just love doing that. Cool. Awesome. Okay, Joshua, I think that's everything I had from my side or that I wanted to put to you. So unless mm -hmm. you've got another one that you uh, you want to maybe put out there, I'll I'll let you let you crack on with your evening. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you regard this as a prediction so much, but right or Kind of is okay, and uh, it's it's bold, and some people will t probably take this the wrong way. But if Ferrari wants to win the world championship, their contract with Vettel, never mind about it. Let him let him ride off into the sunset with his hundreds of millions of uh, euros, whatever have you, and build the team around Leclerc. Yes, Ferrari is the team that works well with a number one and a number two driver. Last time they had a try, the last time they tried to have two number one drivers in the team, one got himself killed during the season, and the other one mashed his legs at Hockenheim. Um, so, uh, yeah, you get a one or two drivers. So you get Leclerc, and so Leclerc, he gels well with the team. 
he's obviously popular with the Tafosi, with with Ferrari, everything have you. Of course, you're going to be popular with Ferrari if you win at Monza. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you know, he's he's well safe in that regard. Then, of course, you got to ask, who do you put in as a second driver? Simple. You put in someone who will be fast enough to be there, but not be a pest to you. Um, and someone, obviously, with a Ferrari connection, uh, someone that Ferrari would love to have in the team. Antonio Giovinazzi. Yeah. So you got Leclerc, who's bloody fast in just about anything he drives. Um, clear number one driver instead of the current situation where they're trying to house two number one drivers, which is just not freaking working. Yeah. And on the back, you got Giovinazzi, who's not a slow driver, but he's, a, a, as I said with Albon, not a slow driver, but just not quite on the top tier level. He's a good rear gunner, and occasionally he'll win some races. And, I mean, that would be great to be the first Italian to win in a Ferrari since Michele Alvaretto. Um, but that is crazy, just the, the fact that the last Italian... Like, you think of how many Italian dry, racing drivers there have been in Formula 1. The last world champion was 1953 with this, with Alberto Ascari. Yeah, wild. How have we gotten this many years without an Italian... <laughs> but then again, you see, you, you remember... Um, the way some of those Italians drove, like, you know, Andrea De Cesaris, you're like, oh, oh, that's why they didn't win. <laughs> but no, I, I do think really that if Ferrari do build the team around Leclerc and they ha- and they go back to their ways of, okay, we've got number one, we've got number two driver, that's where it's going to be. Yeah. Then you should see, at the very least, some improvement, potentially championship winning uh, combination but it's down to whether or not they want to sort of decide upon Bill's contract and just I don't know yeah that, I mean, that remains to be seen yeah I mean I don't know if you saw what I was drinking from or if you were just trying to upset me but uh, no, no, I, no think, I, uh, I saw yeah. that I was like okay this is going to be rocky this is <laughs> no, going to no, be no. interesting <laughs> it's uh, it's not actually my mug it's my girlfriend she's a massive fan but um, ah. no I completely I completely agree with you, actually. I think uh, I spoke about it the other day that, for me, the only thing that makes sense for, for this Ferrari Vettel contract situation was a two-year extension just to have a bit of consistency through through to the new regs. Or, like you said, I think Leclerc is such a marketable guy, such a fan favorite. They absolutely love him. He's quick as anything. And um, I think you're right. I think the next Ferrari world champion is, is going to be him. And I think he needs to have the sort of shackles loosened if you like without having to compete like you said with his teammate actually having someone a little bit more you know eddie irvine-esque on your side um keeping things going so um true but yeah (laughs) so um so yeah i think that's an interesting one and that'll be an interesting dynamic if it was uh you know verstappen with albon and then leclerc with geo backing them up there'd be quite a good little pair of tag teams there so um so yeah super interesting and do you think um you mentioned there, obviously, that Geo move. Would that be for 2021? Do you think this Vettel situation is going to get cleaned up? Or do you think they actually might just say bye-bye? I don't really think that's much... I don't think that's much more of a um, of a Ferrari decision as it is a Vettel decision. Mm-hmm. Because they have offered Vettel a contract, apparently. You've got to take it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, where they said... Uh, that he's been offered a one-year contract, and that's that's telling a one-year contract. That means that over him as a long-term um, option. So, okay, well, who are you waiting for? What Mick Schumacher um, potentially, and and put him into the seat. But then you've got another problem. Um, you know, we we you or you people are obviously going to be backing Mick Schumacher, and then all of a sudden you've got okay, who's the number one, who's the number one driver here? Mm. They've got to have a definitive number one and number two driver because it's a team that's incompetent of having two number one drivers because whether or not it's just chance or a gypsy curse or the fact they're Italian or whatever, I don't know. They just can't seem to handle number one drive, two number one drivers. And Mercedes barely could as well. But, yeah, again, with Vettel, one-year contract extension and a pay cut, now apparently for Vettel, that wasn't good enough. And if that's the case, if he doesn't want to take it up, that's his decision. He wasn't necessarily forced out of it. 
obviously with these times, you know, we've got to be a bit more, um, you know, cost-saving measures and whatever have you. Um, but as well as that, you know, if I'm brutally honest, is he worth the huge money that he's getting right now? I'm sorry, no. I'm sorry, no, because... Do you know, uh, I'm sorry because I haven't looked it up again. You know what his contract was worth, like what his salary was worth each year? No idea, no it idea. It was definitely within the top three, wasn't it? It was big, it was big. Yeah, and I mean, like, I'm not saying he's not worth a lot of money. I'm not sure that he's necessarily worth the money that Ferrari are paying him, which again sounds rich, but it's just like, well, come on, guys. He's just, he's had some, he's had moments, he's messed them up. Um, in the previous year, having pretty bad ones, you know, and I think for a driver like, you know, if, if you're paying a driver that much, you really should be expecting what you're paying. And if you're not getting that, well, why the hell am I paying this guy this much money? Yeah. So, yeah, again, I think it's it's in Vettel's, um, for Vettel, the ball's in his court. Um, it will be sad to see him go because even while I'm not that big of a fan of him, you gotta, you gotta, again, you gotta pay, uh, you know, give credit where credit's due. Same with eyebrow man, oh, sorry, Alonso. <laughs> um, I think, um, I think his ego is the second biggest in the world, um, only under myself. Um, <laughs> but having said that, you mean love him or hate him, he can drive a car. They've been re- really rumors reporting that he's going to come in and take that seat in the Italian press. Oh, I think they're really scraping the stories. Mighty. Lord <laughs> save us. Like, there's only one driver that Formula One needs, and it's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. Yeah, no. Well, no, that's a that's a good good one to wrap it up on. I think. I think that's a, a nice one. I think it, it's got some legs, definitely. And um, like you said, and like you've outlined there, I think it would uh, would make sense for Ferrari to switch back to that really solid one-two structure if they want to have a proper run at the, not only the drivers, but the constructors as well, because they, they just can't help but make team and strategic mistakes, it seems, over the last few few seasons. And I think that might settle them down a little bit. So, um, Well, when they had that, uh, sorry, to, sorry to bother them. Um, when they had that one-two formula, um, it was clear where the results were going, you know? It was, especially in the standings. It was clearly, you know, especially in the Schumacher area, it's the Schumacher era that the results were all going to Ferrari. Um, again, once they back the winning horse, then it definitely works, and I definitely see we're clear in the same light. But it just, again, it just it's just down to whether Ferrari wants to uh, go that route or not. Um, and I just don't know. They've been they've been persisting with Vettel for the last couple of years, and things just haven't quite gone as well as they would have hoped but hey, what do i know i've only got sixty-five thousand subs on youtube <laughs> no one <laughs> fostering fostering i don't know just being a bit of an ass sorry about that oh, no all good all good awesome okay josh well really appreciate you coming on and appreciate the time i know you're crazy busy and uh We've uh, reworked your weekend Saturday even to, to make sure we got this done. So really much appreciate it. And if by any chance there's anyone in the world who hasn't heard of you but is subscribed to me, How probably, dare you? Probably, How dare my, you? Pr- probably my mom and dad, check out Josh's channel. It's obviously going to be linked in the description, but I'm sure you guys all know who he is. Uh, so that's everything from, from myself. And uh, yeah, really appreciate Josh and hopefully chat to you again soon. All right, she's both good to be on. Yeah.